And welcome, everybody. Good to see you and you and you and you. Welcome to the Jim Masters Show Live. I am your host, Jim Masters. It's good to have you with us from all around the world. I see comments coming in already. If you're just joining us for the first time, you know what? This is our 11th week of this broadcast series. We've been waiting 11 weeks for you. It's good to have you with us tonight. We also archive these shows as well. So if you want to see any of the past episodes of this entertainment lifestyle talk show series, it's very simple. All you have to do is go to YouTube at Jim Masters TV, and guess what? You can see every single incredible guest, all the conversations, the inspiring talk that we've had and chat. And of course, on location segments too, in addition to doing the guest segments that I know you guys really love with guests from all walks of life and fields of endeavor and wealth of success and wonderful perspectives and so much more from television and music and film and you know Hollywood and Broadway and just from everyday life. You guys have been really telling us you've been falling in love with the flow of the show. And it reminds you a little bit of some of the older ways that shows were done like this, you know, these entertainment lifestyle talk shows, maybe a little sprinkling of the feeling, maybe of a Regis or Johnny or uh, the Cavett type thing, or um, Mike Douglas, Murph Griffin with the modern vibe and the modern sensibilities of today. And that's a wonderful blend. And you guys are amazing. You're a true blessing and a joy. And thank you so much. We really appreciate that you tune in every night. Some of you are religiously here nightly, and we really, really appreciate that. But also, you share the links. You host watch parties. You comment uh, all day long. I get so many private messages and Facebook messages and, and texts. And there's so many people who are colleagues and friends of mine, too, who are working uh, to uh, propel this broadcast uh, even further, which I think is great. Again, uh, if you're just joining us for the very first time, I'm a professional television radio host, journalist, actor, voiceover artist, writer, producer, stage MC, uh, all of the above. I've been doing it for a long time. 11 weeks ago, as of this week, we created the Gym Master Show Live. And I'm so happy we did because we've had an opportunity to engage with so many extraordinary people. I was so excited to have you on the show because we've got an amazing guest who's going to be with us in just a minute. Right now, as I always say, uh, we have our guests. They are waiting usually in our beautifully appointed uh, green room with uh, lobster and the finest of cheeses and chocolates. And we're giving them all the champagne uh, that they could possibly consume. Maybe not. <laughs> he probably has water and crackers <laughs> next to his computer. But uh, we like to say that we can treat them. If we could, if we had them in our green room, that's what our guests at the Gym Master Show Live would be getting. So anyway, uh, we've been doing this type of thing for years professionally and so happy to have you here as we welcome you from around the world. Now, you know, or if you're just joining us for the first time, good to have you with us. Hope your day's going well. There's a couple of rituals that we do here. We have our famous glass here, and we always like to toast to the audience. So good to have you with us. Jim Masters, your host here. And I toast, the host toast, to you and you and you and you and you and you from all around the world. It's so great to see you. I see so many comments here already. Hmm. Nice and refreshing. This is just, everybody always asks, what's in the glass? What's in the glass? Well, tonight, light. Uh, it's just some light, sweet tea. That's it. It's like um, a green tea. Uh, nice, light, sweet green tea. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very hot here where we are. Uh, we broadcast this show along the, um, or from the greater New York City area. That's where this show comes from, the United States. Greater New York City area between New York and Boston. That's where we're headquartered. And right now it's... Uh, 
I think the heat indices are like 103 degrees or something. Uh, big, big heat wave happening here. Hope things are good where you are. A couple of more characters. Now, as you know, we did a nostalgic week a couple of weeks ago. I say that repeatedly right now in the early stages of the show because some people are brand new and they don't know why we're doing some of these things so that they know what we're doing. We did a nostalgic week a couple of weeks ago and people fell in love with the characters that I brought out. So they said, you got to keep these characters on the show, Jim. So they're here. Of course, we have to have our George Burns, right? George is sort of like my, uh, he's my Ed McMahon. He's my sidekick, <laughs> sort of like a co-host. And so George is here. I know all of you from around the world, you look for George, you ask for George. If I don't have George on, what happened to George? And you'll start commenting, where's George? So he's safe and sound. He's got his smile. He's got his cigar. This was my aunt's. She uh, acquired him on his 100th birthday. They had the uh, collectible uh, commemorative doll. So that is George Burns. He smiles. He sees you. And look, since we did the studio upgrades, it's like George is in 3D. It's pretty cool, huh? So George is here. He greets you. That's one of our cast of characters on the broadcast. There's another one here. You know, I have my television background, so we, we kind of tied into some of that. Light levity, love, or lovity, the word you guys have been loving. There's Jeannie. She's in there. I don't know if you can see her blinking at you. She greets you as well. And uh, she says hello. So we got Jeannie and we got George. And for some reason, George always likes to sit down here next to uh, Jeannie. And whatever's always in my glass, if George is next to it, I don't know if his, his cigar is really like a straw. Uh, you know, one time I had a martini, white watermelon martini or something, and I turned around and the glass was empty and George was next to it. I think his, <laughs> I think that cigar doubles as a uh, hidden straw. Your other friend is here. There he is. There's the silver canine, the lab. I uh, got him on a TV shoot when we were in Europe. He comes from Switzerland. He greets you. He says hello as well. I know everybody loves him. When we had Hollywood legend Sky Arbery on last week, and she was a riot, so funny telling her amazing stories, uh, she fell in love with silver. She says, as a matter of fact, here at my daughter's house, we've got a silver lab too. She loved it. So there's silver, and silver sees all of you and greets you as well here on the Gym Master Show live again. Every host has their cast of characters, usually, uh, but we won't let them know that they're props. They're our cast of characters. We don't want to tell them they're props. And of course, Jimmy's here, right? Now, through everything we've been going through the last couple of months, to see these kinds of faces lightens the load, it inspires you, puts a smile on your face, and, and that's a cool thing in my book. So Jimmy's here, and Jimmy says, hello, this was a childhood toy. And uh, from my parents when I was a kid, and here he is on set with us now. Again, I think I'll have him host if I'm ever out on the town somewhere, if we will be doing that again soon, hopefully, uh, or from maybe under the weather, I think I'll have Jimmy host. What do you think? <laughs> With a face like that, I think he can do it. Hey, everybody, good to see you here. We always like to also welcome some of our viewers with their comments, and then we welcome our illustrious guests. And uh, tonight, I'm so honored to have an extraordinary actor. Uh, he's done a lot, television, film, uh, stage. He comes from an extraordinary family of talent as well. Um, his father, you know, Alan Arkin and his brother, Adam, and he just, you know, he's got a wonderful family and he's uh, very close with his relatives and his family and his loved ones. And he's, uh, he's a guy who inspires people too, not just through all of his years of performance, but he also likes to mentor others and teach others and show others the way. And I love people that do that. I try to do that in my work as well. So Matthew Arkin is my very special guest um, and we're so excited. And we've been chatting just before we went live here on the show. Willie is here. Hello, Mr. Lovity. How do you do? I am waiting a nice evening. Great. Well, Willie, of course, because you go through heroics to watch the show, it's like 1 a.m. there in Holland, um, and you go to bed, and then you set your alarm for 1 a.m., there are your Dutch tulips, okay? Uh, we got these while we were in Amsterdam on a TV shoot, so there are your Dutch tulips just for you, Willie, to put a smile on your face. You're always the first one posting, too, and we really appreciate that. Linda is here as well. Good evening, Mr. Loverday. I hope you had a good day today. Terrific day, extremely busy day. We were dealing with a lot of different uh, things, technical upgrades, but we were also um, working on the format for the next couple of weeks of shows. Tomorrow night, Sean Wiley is here. Sean Wiley is a good friend. He's a uh, terrific singer, actor, choreographer, dancer. 
Uh, he's part of the group Under the Street Lamp, which you've seen on PBS for years. And I've interviewed him multiple times on PBS. He's going to be here tomorrow night live. He's also going to perform live for us as well. So good to see you, Linda. Reno, good friend, Reno, uh, actor, producer, composer, lyricist, uh, acting coach. Good to see you, Reno. He's joined us tonight off teaching. That's right, you're doing your acting class. Have an amazing show. Thank you for those greetings. You'll be able to catch it like you do oftentimes in the archives, Reno. So don't worry. We will have this in the archives for you as soon as the show ends on YouTube at Gym Masters TV. We're also streaming on Facebook at Gym Masters TV. Welcome to my living room, Merlin and Inner Kip, uh, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to ours as well. This is the home studio. We built this set here at the house along the coast here in the northeastern United States. It's always good to see you, Merlin. We love all of the interaction. You've been very interactive with our guests. It's wonderful to have you here. And Renee, hi, Jim and all. Renee is in Iowa. And I hope you're enjoying that nice sweet corn that you showed us pictures of the other day. And I got those photos too. You sent me photos of your uh, post-pandemic haircut. You hadn't had your hair cut uh, since everything started. And I think over the weekend, we'll try to, we do some viewer interaction. We'll try to slip those in over the weekend. We've got amazing guests uh, Sunday. Uh, the legendary and the amazing Bruce Valanche is gonna be here as well on Sunday, but we'll slip those in. Thanks for those photos. I believe me, I have, this is sprayed and held. I have pandemic hair as well right now. Not looking too bad, but uh, haven't been to the, um, salon since March myself. Um, Got to get there soon. Hi, Ernestine in North Carolina. Hi, Jim. Hope you had a great day having one. And it's even better now that you're here in North Carolina. Appreciate it. Good to have you here and really happy you enjoyed Bob Hinkle last night, uh, the TV and film and uh, music industry legend that was with us last night. And I'm glad you're going to go out to his place, uh, that, that ranch, that wonderful music venue one of these days when you're able to do that. He's going to be waiting for you. He's excited that you had mentioned you're going to do that. Uh, Linda as well. Looking awesome, Mr. Loveday. Linda in Florida. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Only the best for our viewers. Christopher in Ohio. Hello, Jimbo. Classic look tonight. Yes, the host, right? Your friendly neighborhood television host. Uh, looking great tonight. Thank you very much, Ernestine. I appreciate that. And Kathleen in New York City, the queen of Queens, New York, we call her. Good friend, we were on the Rachel Ray show together. Hi, Jim, you look great as always. Thank you very much. Like the fuzz. Yeah, this comes on and off. It depends on the project. You know me, I always change my look based on the project, the show, whatever I'm doing, hosting, wherever I'm at. Um, no, it looks like I got a haircut, right? Sometimes I would throw that, those fancy cool hats on. No, the, the, it's sprayed uh, to hold it in place and the headphones are holding it down. So it looks like I got a haircut, right? But if I take the headphones off and I get that hairspray out, boom, <laughs> which is great, you know, if I'm lounging around on the weekend or something, but this is a show for you guys. It's your anniversary. It's your 40th broadcast. Oh, the 40th broadcast. Well, that's terrific. 40 days with us. That is. All right. Double flowers for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate dedication there in Holland, Willie. And uh, you're the best. You're a very beautiful person. Happy 40th. To you and to us, I guess. It's the 11th week for us, and I think you've caught 40 of the shows. Tiffany, beautiful and uh, talented violinist in Chicago, dear friend. We always uh, see each other when I'm emceeing at Carnegie Hall in New York. Good to see you, Tiffany. We love it. Uh, Rini Katz in New York City, fabulous person. We had her on as a guest uh, about a week or so ago. People are still loving that interview. Very moving and inspiring when she opened about her life and the things that uh, occurred in her life and how she's overcome so many incredible things. Brilliant cabaret star. We're so honored to have her here on the show, uh, not only as a guest, but also as a good friend of the show and a faithful viewer. Good to see you and happy birthday again to your mom, Rini. I know she's enjoying that. Cheers, Marilyn. Christopher Taco Tuesday, I guess, huh? In Ohio. Hello, Christine Fairwood in Connecticut. Um, I know we don't have a Larry King doll. We don't have, we have to get one. Um, we got to, we got to get one. Pamela Perkle. Good to see you once again, Pamela. Love having you on the show. And Merlin has smiles and a couple more here. And then, oh my God, there's a ton here. Our dear friend, June Rachelson Aspa. Good to see you, June. I know you just come back from your Massachusetts, New England vacation. You're back in New York City with, uh, with Jerry and the kids. Good to see you, June. Welcome. Love the jacket. Thank you very much. You've probably seen me wear this maybe on 
public television. Uh, you saw Sean Wiley at Big River. He's really, really good. Hi, you. Uh, let's see, you gave three in-person private voice lessons. Wonderful. Fantastic. Uh, it's good to see you as well. Welcome to the show. Everybody's saying that they're enjoying themselves. Um, British uh, Columbia in Canada, Crystal Ray, Crystal and Michael, good to see you there in Canada. You're watching from Kansas City, Missouri, Pamela. Nice to see that as well. So we got a lot of people from all around the, wow. Avril is here too tonight from Hampshire in the United Kingdom. You've become an avid fan of this show as well, uh, Nightly Avril, and we absolutely love that. Uh, we Our family heritage is uh, English, Irish, Swedish, and French. And the master's side goes back to York, to Yorkshire, England. And uh, that's on my father's side. And the father's mother's side goes back to uh, Ireland. So it's good to see you there in Hampshire. Welcome. And uh, you've been telling all your friends there in uh, the UK to join us. And I really appreciate that as well. So we have, and yes, welcome Matthew as well. I know you guys love to welcome. Uh, you are in Japan. Wow, Ayasano, in Japan. Well, thank you for joining us in Japan. I know this, a lot of people have been joining my Facebook page at Gym Masters TV, and that's been rolling over to the YouTube channel at Gym Masters TV and Instagram uh, and catching it as well. So really cool people here. Let me tell you, we welcome you all. We truly do. And it's beautiful to have you here. We're going to look at more comments as we roll and scroll along here, but I want to welcome, again, waiting in our beautifully attired uh, green room with the champagne and the lobster and the cheese and the chocolates from Holland and all, <laughs> maybe not. The incredible Matthew Arkin is here. Matthew, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, hey Jim, it's great to be here. If I had known, I would have gotten a martini and some lobster and, uh, you know, put myself <laughs> together. <laughs> would have gotten ready for it. That's it, right? So how are you and how are you getting through all the craziness and some of the things you've been doing in the last... Uh, couple of months to keep those creative juices flowing, Matthew? Well, uh, a couple of things, you know, you were talking about what you've done with your hair. And if you've seen all <laughs> my, you know, headshots and everything, this is a very different look for me because I was going a little COVID crazy with the hair. And I finally uh, got myself some clippers and did the full Travis McGee, not Travis Bickle, but Travis right. McGee, right. Um, the John D. McDonald character who cuts his own hair. And I right. just, just zip, did zip. it all. But and that's um, it. Think about the money you saved. <laughs> but, you know, you, you've started this show and uh, I've been doing similar things during the pandemic. Uh, you know, we're artists. We can't sit at home and do nothing. We have to find some way of doing what we do. And uh, the first uh, month and a half or so, I, I wrote a mystery novel uh, several years ago that was published several, several years ago. And I read it live on, you know, one, on three nights a week, I would read a chapter or two. And uh, so now that whole thing is up there on the internet to on YouTube to listen to. And then I started two talk shows, one uh, not competing with you. I am not competing with you. I cannot do what you do as well as you do. But um, I'm doing a more, uh, I teach film and uh, I teach acting privately and I teach film at Chapman University. So I've started a, uh, what I call a uh, tips and techniques for actors, authors, and storytellers. So we're talking to writers, we're talking to actors, we're talking to cinematographers. Uh, I had Gregory Harrison, uh, the actor on yesterday. Um, this coming Monday, I'm having a voiceover guy talking mm -hmm. about that aspect of the industry. And then on Wednesday nights, well, I if do- you ever need a host, a TV host. Pardon me? <laughs> If you have any TV host to chat, I'll, I'll bring you on because we we do need to talk about all aspects of right. what we do, right. and and the different aspects of craft that go into every area of the industry, because uh, gone are the days where you needed a studio behind you to do a well produced show. Right. And then on Wednesday nights, I do a silly show with my brother called uh, my brother Anthony called Two Brothers Talk About Food and Movies because that's what we do all the time anyway. And food and movies. Are, yeah. food and movies. <laughs> so we pick a different movie every week and we talk about that movie and, and uh, we've both been you know in and around movies since we were kids. So we do a real deep dive into the history of the movie and then get into stories about the people who we know who worked on the film. Last week was The Verdict. 
Mm. Um, and uh, I had made my Broadway debut with Lou, the actor Lou Stadlin, who's mm -hmm. in The Verdict. So he came on as a guest. And Roxanne Hart, who's also in the movie, came on as a guest. So it, it's that kind of silly but fun show. So let's go back in time. And it sounds really cool. And I'd be happy to, to hop on there with you, Matthew. And I'm, it's an honor, a pleasure to have you here with me. I appreciate the time and moving your schedule around to join us. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate June uh, helping us with that as well. Um, Obviously, you you come from a uh, wonderful family of entertainers, and your father, you know, being Alan Arkin, the brilliant uh, veteran actor, seasoned actor as well. Tell us about those early influences growing up. Were you always a kid that was performing? Were you always sort of strutting your stuff when you were a youth? And and dad and others noticed that. How did this all develop for for Matthew? Well, it was a circuitous route. Um, I do remember, you know, one of my earliest memories is being backstage at uh, a Broadway theater uh, when my father was doing a Murray Shiskel play called Love with um, Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson, an ama amazing theatrical theater couple, and Eli Jackson, an amazing film actor also in, uh, uh, um, in The Misfits, in uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, and I, there was a, it was a comedy. Love was a comedy, but there was a scene in it in which my dad jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. So the set was the Brooklyn Bridge, and he jumped off it uh, into mattresses. And there was a stagehand there with a bucket, and he would throw the bucket, of, just throw the water up. So when my father jumped over, this splash of water came up. And of course, at five years old, I just thought this was. This was amazing that my father got to do for a living was jump off a fake bridge into mattresses. And I remember them letting me do that uh, after the show, at uh, after the matinee, letting me jump into the mattresses. And I thought, I want to do that for a living. I had no concept that it was acting and performing. I, I thought it was, you know, playing on a playground or something. Um, and uh, then years, years later, uh, when I got to, when I made my Broadway debut, it was in a Neil Simon play called Laughter on the 23rd Floor. And the character I played was the, basically the young Neil Simon in the play who opens the show with a monologue talking to the audience as one of the writers on the Sid Caesar show. And um, he, uh, curtain goes up and I'm sitting at the desk writing and I turn to the audience and say, I guess this is what I've dreamed of my whole life. Uh, and it was this feeling of full circle that that those were the very first words I got to speak mm -hmm. on a Broadway stage in front mm -hmm. of an audience. And um, what was that feeling like for you, Matthew, when that happened? It was, well, I was an understudy in mm -hmm. that show. So going on only once was sort of like being strapped to the front of a bullet train. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, it, it, but it was uh, it was an amazing <clears throat> an amazing emotional experience, and then of course Nathan Lane starred in that show. And mm -hmm. at the end of the evening, after everybody comes out for their individual bows, and there's there's the company bow, and that's the end of it. But the company took their company bow, and I'm ready to walk off stage with the company. And Nathan stops and holds up his hands and quiets the audience and made an announcement that it had been my Broadway debut mm. and led the round the the audience in a round of applause uh, for me, for, for, for make, for getting there. Uh, and uh, I just, I burst into tears. It was a very emotional experience to, to get there. Um, but uh, the, the actual, the, the first actual acting job that I had was when I was eight years old and my older brother Adam was 11. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was already uh, starring in movies, but he was starting to feel like many actors do. Hey, I think I want to try my hand at directing. Right. And so he decided to direct, uh, he had directed a short film already and he decided to direct another short film um, to sort of start learning before doing a feature. Uh, and he took a... Um, a short story that he had written when he was in high school about his younger brother and sister. And he rewrote it to be about two boys, strangely enough, named Adam and Matthew. 
and uh, he rewrote it as a short film and shot it with me and Adam in three days. And uh, eight years old, that was my first professional job, got my SAG card. And then the film was nominated for Best Short at the Academy Awards in 1969, I believe. At eight we years win. old. We were nominated. <laughs> at eight. At, uh, yeah, well, the movie, not, not yeah, right, the, movie, right. the movie was just me and Adam. So uh, we couldn't have been that bad. Right. Uh, <laughs> So you knew then you had an idea like, I really like this. I'm enjoying this. This is in my DNA. I, I need some more of this. I want to, you know, get out there and, and make people feel good and tell stories, be a storyteller, make them smile and sort of lighten the load for them. You knew early on that you wanted to do this, huh? Yeah. And then interestingly, uh, so I started working a little bit in film and television. My first major uh guest star role on television was on an episode of Kojak in 1975. And again, the way things strangely go full circle, Eli Wallach, who mm -hmm. was in love in that play love that I was at five years old watching from the wings. I played Eli Wallach's son on this episode of Kojak. Um, and uh, how amazing to have that opportunity to be, oh, oh, yep, you've got that picture. There I am at 15 and Eli. And uh, it, was, uh, it was extraordinary to get to do something like that with somebody who had been a little bit like an uncle to me growing mm -hmm. up. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, really sort of, and, and on set, he certainly, you know, took me under his wing. Um, mm. And it, it was really lovely. Uh, when you think about that, here you are working at that age with Eli Wallach. I mean, and then, you know, even Telly Savalas is there. And, you, you know, know I, I didn't know then, you know, I didn't know, you know, now I will, I will be, I have a friend who's a huge uh, Arthur Miller oh, yeah. fan. And he has a, a, a beautiful framed print of that famous photograph from the Misfits with Clark Gable and Arthur Miller and and uh, um, uh, who it's 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 Clark Gable, Arthur Miller, Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. and and Eli and and now I look at it and I I get emotional all over again, you know. But at, at fifteen, you know, I was a smart ass kid. I didn't I I didn't know uh, Michael Gazzo was also in in this episode of of Kojak. Um, F. Murray Abraham plays a thug in this, uh, you know, just a, a small role as as a, a leg breaker for a bag man. And, <laughs> I, you know, I was this smart ass kid. I had no idea the the people I was having the opportunity to work with. So with your father, uh, when you had these opportunities and you were, you know, you were scoring, you were doing well and, and people were loving your work at these early ages. Um what was your dad saying, you know, being this veteran uh, actor all these years? I'm, I'm sure very proud and encouraging you along the way, right? Uh, he, he was encouraging. He did. Uh, I did, however, have a take a left turn um, after college. Um, I, uh, I took a left turn. I was the only one in the family who had a real uh, I'm certainly by no means the smartest member of my family. I am the only member of my family who had a real interest in, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, institutional academic life. Uh, so after college, I ended up going to law school and practiced law for five years uh, until I realized that I hated it and I and I quit to come back to acting. And uh, I think that was a, that was a little tough for my dad to to watch me uh, throw that away. Uh, but several years later, uh, there was one particular play that I did <clears throat> that we went out to dinner afterwards after he came to see it. And uh, he um, he told me that that he thought I had made the, the right decision and was doing the right thing. Um, so that was that was very meaningful to me that he he came around and felt like I'd made that even even though I took this circuitous route that he felt like I made the right choice ultimately. So how did taking that route help you uh, in life, having that other, you know, knowledge that you've gained by <clears throat> not just sticking with the acting, but, you know, informing and educating yourself in another area of life? 
Well, after you've been screamed at by a few judges and threatened with a contempt charge, there's nothing that an audience can really do to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it made walking out on stage a much less nerve wracking experience <laughs> because true. I realized, you know, if I do a bad job tonight, nobody's actually going to go to jail or okay. lose their house. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. so it helped me. It helped me put things in 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 perspective. Um, it also um, it was it was still a career in which you had to uh, do a lot of speaking in front of other people and oh, yeah. think on your feet very fast. Yes. Um, so uh, so in some ways it didn't feel like as much of a departure as. Uh, as you might think. But then after I, I quit law and, uh, you know, my dad said to me, well, you know, if you're going to do this, you have to really, you can't just go do it. You've got to study. And if you're going to study, you should study with the best. Right. And I said, who's that? And he said, Uta Hagen. So I went and auditioned for her class and I mm. got in and uh, she kicked my butt for many years. Mm, mm. What was that experience like? I mean, that's quite an honor, huh? It, it was an honor and it was extraordinary. I mean, she was um, she was so incredibly insightful. She was very no nonsense. Right. Um, she was there was nothing touchy feely or mystical about her approach. Uh, she eschewed being treated like some you know font of wisdom. She didn't want acolytes. Mm. Um, I always think of her acting technique as I call it the auto mechanics of acting. You know, so many acting teachers get into, you know, oh, there's all this. One. She was like, no, no, here's the problem. Here's how you do. Here's what you do. <laughs> Cut to the <laughs> chase. That's yeah. it. This is, th this is the obstacle and this is how you surmount it. Uh, and uh, it, 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 she's just really, she was no nonsense. And How would you describe her method of teaching? What for people that may that haven't uh, experienced that? Um, she 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 breaks down what we have to do on stage into a very uh, particular uh, particular problems that need solving, um, uh, and uh, and each and she has a series of of uh, 10 or 12 exercises that are, are very simple and very direct that you do uh, alone. Um, and they, they give you the, the tool bag that you need uh, for when you go on stage. The other thing that I love that she did was that whenever you presented an ex one of her exercises or a scene with a scene partner, uh, and this is something I do with my students and it makes them crazy, um, is the very first thing she would say when it was over was she would say, what can you tell me? Because you ultimately need to know how to do what you're doing without somebody telling you. Uh, as an actor, you're going to work with bad directors on stage and film and television, and you've got to be able to have a critical eye and know how to uh, how to work your craft without somebody holding, holding your hand. Right. Um, and it's so funny. And I, 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 and I tell my students this, when they start studying with me, I say, after you do your scene, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you what you can tell me. And what I'm asking you for is to tell me, you know, what you were trying to accomplish and what you, what you felt you were able to accomplish, how, how close you came to hitting your target and your goal. Right. I want you to develop your own internal critical eye. And invariably, they finish their scene and I can and I say, what can you tell me? And they say, well, the play is about, and I'm always like, going, I, I know what the play is about. I want you to tell me what the scene's about. I know what the scene is about. I just watched the scene. 
What were you trying to do? Because there are a number of things you might be working on on any particular iteration of that scene in a class. You know, you may be saying this time today, I really want to contact the, you know, the internal difficult emotional place in this moment in the scene. Well, if that's what you were working on, what did you do to try and do that? And how did it work for you? And if it didn't work, what are we going to try next? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, so I, I I I certainly would not put myself up next to her as a teacher, but but she's certainly what I aspire towards. Towards absolutely, and, and with the expressive experience that you've had, I mean, um, which is extraordinary. Let, let's uh, take it from the Kojak appearance with Eli <laughs> Wallach. Uh, what you know, and then of course you, you mentioned studying law. So that gives you a different perspective. And um, somebody's posted that uh, litigators make great actors as well. <laughs> I guess there's sort of a parallel there they some made. Of, some of the good lit litigators. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so uh, what, what was it that brought you back into performance and, and acting when you were in the, the field of law? I, I think part of the problem was that um, I was, from the time I was 11 years old, when I read uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. I was in the thrall of that novel and yeah. that character. I ended up writing my my thesis on it in college, and um, uh, and I thought that, and of course Gregory Peck in the movie, one of the the great characters in in the history of American cinema, I think, and one of the great movies in, in America's in American cinema, the, the craftsmanship in making oh, yeah. that film is, is extraordinary. Um, uh, and I think that early imprint made me think uh, that Atticus Finch was the kind of guy he is because he's a lawyer. No, he's the kind of guy he is because he's the kind of guy he is. That's right. And, and my life was not turning as a lawyer was not turning out that way. Um, and also, as an attorney, um, even when you do a great job for people, they are generally not happy with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, which makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, like, for instance, if somebody ripped you off for a hundred thousand dollars, and we sue them, and you're you're a hundred percent in the right, we're going to go to court, and um, the judge is going to make us settle. They're going to try and make us settle. That's the case. And right? if, if if the other side offers you eighty grand. That's an amazing settlement because you yeah. could lose at trial. The judge is going to say, you're crazy. Take right. the 80 grand. So you're going to take the 80 grand. I'm going to probably end up taking 20 of that by that point. So you, you, you lost $40,000. You're not yeah. going to be happy with anybody. Yeah. Not happy. You know, you won and you got six, 60 cents on the dollar, right? Yeah. That's if I do a really good job for you. Um, so uh, I just felt like I was making people miserable all the time. And also, I think, you know, growing up with my dad on film sets all, all over the world and watching things like, um, you know, we, my brothers and I were gone for eight months out of school when they were making Catch-22. And to sit there and watch those B-25 planes and buildings blowing up and, and Paul Apprentice on the raft, you know, it, it was like growing up with the circus. Right. I, right. I go to an office every day. It was, it was not in my, my blood. It was Total not opposite worlds. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I gotta tell you, I have not looked back. I'm, I'm grateful for, for the discipline and the knowledge that I gained in those years, but I have not once regretted the, the choice that I made, even though um, I probably could have made an awful lot more money as an attorney than I've made as an actor. Um, I'd rather live in a garret doing what I'm doing than uh, live in a mansion uh, doing something I, I don't like. That you hate it. Um, 
and you couldn't sleep at night. But what's great about having all these different. Well, I still can't sleep at night. Say who, that anyway. Who can sleep at night these days? Especially the last couple of months, I know. <laughs> well, even know the day of the week. Um, I'm always having every, I like today's what, uh, Tuesday. And I'm thinking already it's Thursday and I'm supposed to wrap things up by Friday. And it's like, wait a minute, it's only Tuesday. What? <laughs> and it's already, it's what, the end of July almost here. It doesn't even, right. even know what month it is. Um, I think it's really great. The experiences and those pivot points that you had in your life, Matthew, because when you do teach others and you do inspire others who want to sort of go into the entertainment field and they want to become actors and, and other areas of expertise in these fields that you and I are in, um, you can really guide them in ways like, hey, let me tell you, uh, I tried that or I did that or I wouldn't necessarily go that route or, or if you do that, here's what can happen. You've had this breadth of experience at so many different levels from, you know, obviously coming from a family of, of entertainers, that's part one. Uh, getting educated yourself by watching your dad and, and having your brothers as well, but also uh, some of these other routes that you took in your own personal life that just add perspective and wisdom uh, that can be of great help to those that you're teaching, right? I, you know, I hope so. Uh, I also, I, you know, I tell my students, I think you need to get out there and live a life. Um, I don't think you... I don't think you have to be conservatory trained to be a good actor. I think, I think, uh, act th the more you're able to bring your own experience, the richness of that experience to your work, the better an actor you're going to be. Um, and, uh, you know, I worry a little bit sometimes about the generation coming up that is so, um, careful and, and sheltered. Um, because, uh, and, and so much that so much of their interaction is through this, mm -hmm. you know, because I have, I have acting students who I realize their, um, their, uh, range of emotional expression is, um, I am really angry at you. Mm, yeah. I am breaking up with you. And they don't know, they don't have the the face to face raw emotion that's that those of you know now some people you might say we live in a safer world but we also live in a world of the the range of experience that that some of the younger actors are bringing to their work is is somewhat limited and i think a lot is because of this and the computer. Now I'm a, you know, I am a tech head. I love computers. I, I, I'm not a Luddite. I don't say, oh, computer bad, but get out there and, you know, go on dates, get your heart broke, yeah. have, have face-to-face -face arguments with people, tell people face-to-face, -face, I love you. Tell people face-to-face, -face, I never want to see you again because right. you've right. got to bring that to your life and your work. I love this. Life is not an emoji. Emoji centric. That, Marianne, that is a great comment. That mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, Merlin had asked, she's in uh, Ontario, Canada. Was your mother in the acting business? Um, my stepmother who raised me was and, and is an, an amazing uh, actress. She, she and my father actually, excuse me, um, my my parents divorced right after I was born. Begs the question of what went wrong, right? I mean, I showed up and the man and they uh, said, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> "I'm a home wrecker." Um, <laughs> uh, when I was five, my uh, my father married uh, a woman who we actually met, or, or I guess they met. They married when I was three or four. Uh, they met on stage in uh, Enter Laughing, which was my father's Broadway debut. Uh, and she played his girlfriend in the play. And it was this storybook romance. And, and they married. And, and then uh, when I was seven, I came to live with them, with my father and my stepmother, Barbara, who raised me from that time. And, you know, people get confused because when I say mom, they don't know if I'm referring to Barbara, who I call mom because she raised me, or my real mother, who Your real mother I lived with from the time I was seven. Um, but but Barbara, you know, she's grandmother to my kids. She's 
she's Grammy to my my son and my daughter, and just an amazing grandparent, and has always always been in my life, and has always been my mother, and always will be. How has uh, how has your father? What we're saying was she's amazing. Yeah, amazing yeah. actress. Amazing. Actually, in um, which I found out recently, um, William Inge's last Broadway play mm. she starred in that with Bo Bridges, mm. um, at, which was directed by Harold Clerman. You know, right. so he worked with these legends. Speaking of legends, your dad. Um, how how has this influence of your father? Um, influenced you along the way, you know, having somebody that's a veteran and, and beloved in the industry by so many people. Um, tell us about that relationship with your dad and how that, you know, maybe enhanced some of what you do as well and influenced it. Who? <laughs> um, uh, uh, John, John Smith. Remember uh, him? <laughs> um, he, he sets a very, he set a very high bar. You know, he set a very high high bar. I feel like his work is so um, focused and so natural. Um, it there's actually, you know, he came out of a tradition, uh, the tradition of improv. He was with Second City, and and that tradition was really important to him and very dear to his heart. Um, I I did not come out of that tradition, uh, even though that's his, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm the academic, uh, in the family. And I think that's, that has translated into my work as well. I am very, um, very text-based. I'm very interested in the text. Um, and, uh, I improv, uh, Improv might happen for me once I feel that I've become rooted in the text and and know and understand the character because I have a thorough understanding of, of the text um, and all of the depths and, and layers of that text. And then once I'm secure in that, sometimes an improvis uh, improvisational moment may grow out of that. Uh, but improvisation is not for me, I think, the starting place that it is for my father. Um, but, but ultimately, I think all roads lead to Rome. And uh, one of the things that I dislike most in, in any school of acting or theory of acting is orthodoxy. You know, the I I don't I tend not to trust actors who say this is the way the work is done, um, because you do not approach Neil Simon the way you approach Chekhov, um, and uh, we need to have all of those tools and approaches in our toolbox. Uh, that's so true. That is so true. You know, that leads me to, uh, you're intuitive too. My segue was to talk about Neil Simon and being a part of the Sunshine Boys with Tony Randall and Jack oh. Klugman. Tell us about that experience. How did that all develop and what was that like, Matthew? Um, that was that was extraordinary. It was extraordinary uh, partly because I, I don't know if you know that, um, you know, my father directed the original production of the Sunshine Boys in 1973 with Jack Albertson and Sam Levine. Right. And I would hang out at rehearsals and watch them do that in the original production. Lou Stadlin played the nephew in the original Broadway production um, and was amazing in it. Then years later, I make my Broadway debut in a Neil Simon play with Lou Stadlin in the production then did the national tour of that play with Lou yeah. and then go on to do the first role that I do on Broadway, other than the, the understudy role that I did one night on Broadway. And the first role that I actually have on Broadway is in the revival of the sunshine boys playing the role that my friend Lou played, you know? So again, the way these things come full circle. And I remember sitting in rehearsal, with Tony and Jack, who were just amazing. And uh, they were working on a moment um, 
in in the play where the two characters are arguing over where a chair goes and Tony and Jack are trying to work out the bit and they're moving the chair about two feet each time. They're like saying, that's not the doctor's sketch. And then they move the chair two feet and they say, that's the doctor's sketch. And the bit wasn't working. And I was sitting there and I was remembering watching the original rehearsals of that scene and the joke is that at the end of the argument, one of them moves the chair and in the, it actually says it in the script, maybe an inch, like they just shift it a little tiny bit. And then they say, that's the doctor's sketch. Uh, and there I was sitting, you know, at the age of uh, what I think I was 38 at the time. And I'm like saying, you know what? This is one of those times where you just keep your fat gap shut. You know, say a word, right? They'll figure it out. <laughs> Um, but uh, <laughs> one night backstage, uh, and this is a funny thing about perspective um, and where people are coming from and where they are in their lives. We're backstage at the Lyceum Theater. The show was a hit. Jack is on stage doing the doctor sketch bit before Tony and my entrance into the sketch or Tony's entrance into the sketch. And then I come on when Jack has the heart attack, but mm -hmm. Tony and I are standing there in the wings waiting backstage and the audience is just screaming with laughter. And Tony turns to me and he looks at me and he says, you really gave up the law to do this? And I said, I looked at him and I said, um, yeah. He's, and he's, he's dead serious. He he's just, serious. Oh, yeah. He says, he says why? And I, I pointed, like, I said, do you hear that? Yeah. He said, yeah. people didn't laugh when you were practicing law. And I said, maybe judges. <laughs> maybe <laughs> some judges. <laughs> right. That's about it, right? Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Did he understand after you explained it that way? Yeah, I, I think so. But, you know, th there's somebody who I, I, he had a great love of the theater. Oh, yeah. But also somebody who's been in it for ever. And there are those nights where it's, it's like, oh, it's time to make the donuts. <laughs> right. I don't yeah. care how much you love the art. There are nights where it's it's like yeah. oh, I have to go make the donut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, not every night is exactly uh, glitz glamour and smooth as silk. Yeah, champagne riches and caviar dreams. <laughs> right now, another exciting thing, an amazing thing in your career is originating the role of Gabe and that uh, Pulitzer Prize winning Dinner with Friends. Tell us about that. That that was one of the great privileges of my life, and and a real break for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, I crawled through broken glass to get that that part. I had to audition for it four times. Wow. Um, I I I was told three times that I didn't. I was told three times that I didn't get it. Um, and gave up, and then would get another. Then I'd get a call saying you have another audition. And the last time was they were starting rehearsal on a Monday and uh, no. Yeah. On Monday. And I, my last audition was on the Thursday before and I knew a Friday night came and I didn't hear anything. So I thought, okay, you didn't get it. That Monday night I'm teaching an acting class seven o'clock. My agent calls me and says, they want to see you again tomorrow. And I said, the, the, they were supposed to start rehearsal today. And my agent said, yeah, they didn't. Um, so I showed up at the, uh, the audition um, and my nemesis, there was one other actor there, my nemesis, um, actually uh, an actor, uh, uh, a wonderful actor and, a, and, a, and was a friend, but the kind of guy who was a couple of notches up above me and got a lot of the things that I would have thought, God, I would have liked to have been able to do that. But of course he has more credit. So I showed up and he was there and my heart just sank because I knew I wasn't going to get it. And this is, so now it's my fourth audition and nobody has said anything to me. Uh, usually when you audition again uh, a second time, they say, you know, we liked what you did before, but could you try this? Could you do something a little different? Nothing, not a word. 
So I walked into my audition and Dan Sullivan was there, an amazing uh, Tony Award winning director, uh, Donald, uh, Donald Margulies, obviously not yet a Pulitzer Prize winner because he won it for Dinner with Friends, but an Obie winner and just somebody whose work I was constantly floored by. Um, and I walked into the room and I looked at them and I said, what do you want? Because <laughs> I, I, I wanted to know what I was doing wrong, you know? And Dan Sullivan just pointed at the stage. He said, just go do what you did before. And I went and did exactly what I'd done the previous four auditions because it was the only way I could understand that role. And uh, the next day I was walking up Broadway to a voiceover audition and I got a call saying, you start, no, it was that day. It was about two hours later. I was walking up Broadway to a voiceover audition, and I got a call saying, you start work tomorrow. Um, and about two weeks into rehearsal, I was suffering from terrible paranoia because all I could think was Dan didn't want me or Donald didn't want One of them didn't want me. That's That must have been what the problem was. Um, and I... I finally said to Lisa Emery, the incredible actor who is playing my wife, um, and she's uh, she's on uh, Ozark now, just w one of the great American actors, I think. Uh, I said to her, I said, God, I'm just, I'm so paranoid every day at rehearsal because I don't know which one of them didn't want me. And she said, what, what are you talking about? And I said, and I told her what the audition process was like. And she said, they both wanted you. You wouldn't be here if they didn't both want you. I said, well, what was the problem? She said, the producers didn't want you. The producers wanted a name in the role. Um, and that that lifted a great weight off my, uh, off my shoulders um, because I don't really care what the producers want. I care right. what care what the director and Donald Margulies want, I care what Dan Sullivan and Donald Margulies want. Exactly. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't have, I, I had done the sunshine boys, but that was a revival and it was, you know, I got nice notices in it, but to a large extent, it was the Tony and Jack show, you know? Um, uh, so, uh, and, and the other three people in dinner with friends had a lot more, uh, much bigger resumes than mm -hmm. I did at the time. So it was a real, a real break and something I will always be grateful for and, and we'll look back on as one of the one of the great experiences of my life absolutely absolutely and, and and again when you have opportunities like that and to soak it all in and just to to witness everything that you've witnessed it really is amazing to be able to to look back at that and cherish that and again uh, call that up every once in a while as a memory and then share that with those again that you're you're teaching along the way you've also had some really cool roles in movies along the way as well tell us about the entree into the movie world film uh, well, my, my movie work hasn't been, you know, n the, the movie work itself hasn't been anything to write home about. I had, you know, minor roles, you know, a line. I, I, I have a, a role in, um, in Liar Liar. Yeah. That family members go see it knowing that I have a role in it. And afterwards they'll say, well, I saw the movie. Where were you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or in um, Death to Smoochie, in which I got to do a scene with Robin Williams, but it's wintertime, and a stuntman had to do half the scene. Mm -hmm. so I have like a thing across my face through through half the scene, you know, a, a winter face mask on. So, again, another great role where, you, although I did have, I did get kissed on the lips by Robin Williams. Not in the movie, but just because we uh, in the movie he tackles me at the top of the steps of the uh, the uh, museum of natural the museum of natural history no New York museum of uh, the, the Met oh the Met yeah Fifth Avenue and we yeah. we roll or the stuntman the two stuntmen roll all the way down the steps and land on Fifth Avenue. And it was a cold winter day. It was snowing a little bit. And um, then we had to roll into this shot where we're going to be 
he's on top of me screaming at me. So we're, we're, they're lining up the shot and we're lying on the sidewalk on fifth Avenue and he's lying on top of me and I'm lying there and they're getting the lights set up and we're just lying there and he's on top of me and we're waiting and we're just waiting and waiting and waiting and looking at each other with just nothing going on. And finally I said to him, I said, you know, I'm, um, I'm starting to have feelings for you. <laughs> and he planted one right on the lips. Big, <laughs> big kiss right on the mouth. And it was like, wow. That's it. <laughs> that to keep me warm on those lonely. That nights. was uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you were also in an unmarried woman. Oh my gosh, you're going way, way back. Yeah. We, we, we did our research. <laughs> I was 16 years old and uh my first, uh, my first movie makeout scene with Lisa Lucas, and I was um, no, I was seventeen. Um, I, I think I, I think we were both seventeen years old. And the producers did a really nice thing, or the produ i don't know if it was the producer's idea or if it was uh, Paul Mazursky's idea, the director. They did a great thing where they, they called me and they said, "Look, we want you, you take take Lisa out on a date, like go to dinner in a movie, or you know." And they gave me money. They paid for it for us to go out on a date. And it was a funny role because we just had that one little tiny scene. I mean, I think I'm on screen for like 30 seconds. Everybody thinks it's a big role in the movie because there is scene after scene where she's on the phone with Phil, yeah. her boyfriend. She's talking to him on the phone. The parents are talking about him. Oh, we like Phil, blah, blah, blah. I'm only on screen for it's the tiniest, tiniest little role, but it's a much bigger role in people's minds because he's talked talked about a lot. Exactly. You know, I could also say I played Harvey, the Invisible Rabbit, um, Lefty, and Waiting for Lefty, uh, Godot. You know, those are other big roles that are actually very small. So my question is, which kiss was better with Lisa or with Robin? Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you could toss that around. We could always circle yeah. back on definitely, that. <laughs> definitely, with Lisa. definitely with Lisa. It was a big, you know, the Teamsters though, God, the Teamsters, the crew on movies, they were merciless. They were merciless while oh, we were doing oh, that. that was they were like, come on, let's see your technique. Come on, <laughs> show us, show us. I'm like, guys, <laughs> you know, Paul Mazursky was like, guys, leave them alone. They're not, you know, they're teenagers. <laughs> That is funny. Yeah. Uh, what room are you in now? Uh, is this like an office uh, in your home? This is, um, you know, it's funny. This is my bedroom, actually. But I have, this is uh, the office slash set for my talk show. This is uh, where I do my uh, my YouTube stuff. It didn't used to look like this in my bedroom, but... Uh, with the with the pandemic and having to go to do it like i'll bet if we turned the camera around where you are mm -hmm. we'd be surprised at what the rest of that room looked like there's a living room couch there's chairs there's a whole living room but you side. but you built you've built your set right yeah right? You did exactly and that's what i did here i moved i moved everything around so that i would have this sort of office yeah office -y feel um it's, it's amazing right yeah. it's amazing how you get uh your user your creative noggin right, right. and we, right over here i have a whole, a whole nother monitor so yeah. that for when i can need to throw pictures up on the uh you know like i'm sure you're doing you probably use two monitors two. right no actually all using one one monitor. Of, yeah doing it all yeah, a second monitor helps get those pictures up there if, yes. you've, got, if you've got a whole bunch of them. So uh, television as well. You mentioned Kojak early on, and what a great you know beginning there with Eli Wallach and, like I said, Telly Savalas and all. But uh, people might also recognize you from some others in CIS, Law & Order, Bull. Tell us about some of the other television performances you've had an opportunity to be a part of. I don't think they'll recognize me now that I shave. Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, the one episode that I did that has gotten more response than anything else was an episode of Special Victims Unit. Yes, where uh, the week after it aired, I would be walking down the street in Manhattan and somebody would, would buttonhole me and say, you son of a bitch. 
because <laughs> my my wife had been raped and she got pregnant and I left her. It's that episode and uh, it it's an episode they air a lot apparently. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, my response when people would get angry at me was mm -hmm. always the same. I would say I'd say first of all, it's a television show, and she lied to me. <laughs> So there's that. And, but you know, it's funny <laughs> the times that we're living in. Yeah. Whenever that episode airs, within a few days, I'll get a message from somebody Hey, I caught that episode of yeah. SVU in which you were such a bastard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, I think it was the day before yesterday. I'm sitting at my computer. My phone suddenly starts dinging maybe five or six times. So obviously, right now, everybody in the world is at home watching SVU on on uh, USA it's because amazing. my phone just blew up. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where yeah. usually I'll hear from one person when when the yeah. episode airs. And the phone's gone from ringing to now dinging. <laughs> they they yeah. used to ring, <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the I think one of the so that that was but the law and orders were fun and i did yeah. enough of them to get to to get comfortable there um i got to do an episode as a they had me as a court reporter because they shoot it over in new york right, right. yeah and it, that was a lot of fun it was really it was through central casting and all yeah and i guess they you know uh was the the look and everything that they wanted and it was really really cool it was really uh an interesting experience i really enjoyed it it was a lot yeah. of uh, a lot of fun, great crew, and you know all professionals, and that's a series that's just gone on. That whole franchise of Law and Order has gone oh, on forever, for years, yeah. you know. Then one thing that was just terrific fun was uh, I was did a couple of episodes on the second season of Get Shorty. Yes, uh, and that show, my older brother was one of the. Um, executive producers and was the supervising director of it and was directing the two episodes that, that I was in. Uh, and it was the first time we'd worked together, uh, as, um, gosh, I think it may have been the first time we actually worked together since I was eight and he was 11 and now he's the director. Amazing. Um, and I think we were both a little nervous going into it. Like what was it going to, you know, uh, I think he was maybe nervous if I would be bridling at my older brother telling me what to do. And I was nervous about, will I be letting my older brother down? Um, and it ended up just being an, a lovely experience. You yeah. know, we, thought we ended up feeling like we had a shorthand. Mm -hmm. and also, you know, he's been directing for a long time now. I have much more stage experience than I do in film and television. Um, he has series after series after series behind him as an actor and then directing a ton of television. So I had no, you know, I, no problem saying, Hey, this is, you know, this is your bailiwick, you know, you know, this, so mm -hmm. tell me what to do and make me better. Right. Know? And, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I actually went to him at, at one point because I was feeling, I, I, it, it was so easy working with him that I got worried that he was just letting me off the hook. Mm, yeah. And I went to him and I said, are you, are you getting what you need? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, it's been going, it's been very easy and you've been, Is this just brotherly love or I yeah. Want to make sure you're getting what you need. And he said, he said, Oh yeah. Um, if I wasn't getting, he said, we would not be moving on until I got what I needed. We're gonna get what I need. So yeah. that, you know that was nice to hear. That you know that and uh, and then there was one there was one moment in one of the episodes where I I did something that I don't think anybody in the world would see or notice, but it was for him. Mm -hmm. And when we were watching the episode once together, we uh, later when the episode aired and we were watching it that moment came and he cracked up and it it made me so happy because it was just like a little easter egg that i put in there just for him mm. and and he got it what was it do you remember what you did i remember exactly what it was it was a moment where we were in, we were in a group therapy session and and ray romano is uh is is talking about struggles he had with his dad 
Um, and the therapist says, well, if, if your dad, you know, and Adam and I get along great with our dad, but, you know, I don't think there's anybody out there who doesn't have, you know, dads are powerful figures and we, we, as kids, we struggle with them. And, and, uh, and then particularly if you're going into the same damn career as they're in, uh, and they're uh, an iconic figure like like our father is. I think we both that that can't help but be some kind of uh, not necessarily a weight, but a bar that you aspire to. So the therapist says to Ray Romano, it says, you know, what what would you say to your father right now if he was here? And Ray. Ray launches into this monologue about what I would say to him. And, you know, and I, and, and it ends with him saying, and I would say, dad, I, I love you, but, I, but, I, but I can't spend my life trying to please you anymore. Uh, or something like that. It was along the lines of that. And when Ray said that I wasn't looking at him, I was sort of looking down at the floor, just sitting next to him, listening. I'm in the group therapy session. And he says, I love you, but I, I can't worry about pleasing you anymore. And I just went. And that and that was in there just for Adam, because I know we both we've both gone through that thing of like, you know, how do you how do you go into the same career that your father went into when he's somebody like our father and still and still say, yeah, but I, I have to figure out how to do this. I, I love you and I respect his work. Mm -hmm. I still have to figure out how to do it my way. Mm, right, right. Exactly. I value, your... value every bit of advice my father's ever given me about craft. Um, but but no matter how much he tells me, you still have to figure it out yourself. Which is exactly right. And, and he gave you the slack and rope and room to do that? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we got to work together once um, uh, on, on a film. I mean, we've worked together several times, but we worked together uh, in a film where we had a lot to do together uh, once, uh, an independent feature called Raising Flag. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I am so extraordinarily grateful that that experience came after Dinner with Friends, mm -hmm. where I felt like, uh, I was able to meet my dad on set and and bring it because he wants somebody who's coming to play. Right. You know? right. And if I had come uh, all meek and mild, yeah, then it wouldn't have been fun for him. Uh, yeah. Similarly to, I, I remember a, a moment with, with Jack Klugman where um, we're, we were in rehearsal and uh, – we're, we're getting to the scene where it was right before Tony Randall's first entrance and Jack's character is very nervous about seeing him for the first time. And, and I went up to Jack and I started straightening his tie for him before Tony's entrance. I started straightening his tie and Jack slapped my hand. It's like, get, get, and slapped my hand away. And when we were done, I walked up to him. This was early in the rehearsal process. I walked up to him. I said, I said, Jack, I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, I should not have, you know, touched you or messed with your tie without talking to you about it before. And he looked at me, he said, I was acting for Christ. <laughs> oh, he want he wants me to come and bring and bring it. You know, he doesn't right. want me to be deferential on stage. Right. You got to right. do what the character would do. <laughs> exactly. And you and you got that early, which was fantastic <laughs> from Jack. I'm wanting for Christ's sake. <laughs> Here's two faces in your life that folks uh, will recognize here. Oh, geez. Mm -hmm. That's my older brother, Adam, on the left no, and, me, and me on the right. Right. <laughs> um, with my new haircut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. Your brother, a fabulous actor. And then, of course, uh, dad, the incomparable yeah. uh, Alan Arkin uh, right there. Uh, acting is in the uh, in the genes in your family. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Uh, we talked about uh, dinner with friends. I'm going to pull up this shot here. I have wow. a I have a nickname for the that that shot. It's a little off color. I don't know if I can say it on air. Can I say something a little off color? Give it a shot. 
I call that I call that photograph. That's not my foot. <laughs> uh, but it, it actually is my foot. But I've just always thought that the angle that that <laughs> photograph was taken at is is a little inappropriate. <laughs> Now you have people wondering if he's uh, telling the truth or not. No, that's my. <laughs> Here's another. Uh, so what was that for people that might have not have seen it? What was happening there? What was that scene about? That's the last scene in the play. Um, and and sh Lisa. It, oh God, I can't look at mm -hmm. that picture without just remembering that scene in that moment. Yeah. Lisa, it, it's that this scene is sort of the heart of the play where she is confessing this dream that she's had she's worried about about us in in the wake of the divorce of our best friends and she's mm. had this dream and she tells me this this incredibly complicated dream that she's struggling with and and my response is uh i say huh and go back to my book <laughs> and and she, she loses it on yeah. me. Like that's, that's what you have to say. I, I tell you this, this dream, this terrifying dream, and and you have nothing to say. And 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 Gabe, who has been very silent through the whole play, finally has to speak to her. Mm -hmm. It's a tough, tough moment. It reminds so, me, a beautiful play. Oh God. yeah. It's funny because it makes me think of sometimes when I uh, leave voicemails or I email or I text, mine tend to be very lengthy and long because I do it as if I'm, it's not just factual, but I do it as if I'm actually talking to you. When I leave the right. voicemail, when I write the email or when I text, it's as if we're having the conversation and I'm trying to give you as much information as fact as possible. And sometimes, you know, it could be a little mini Gettysburg address and the response will be K. <laughs> yeah, as yeah. an as an okay, and right. I'll be like, you mean I couldn't even get the O with the K yeah, to get the okay? No, just K. Yeah, my, daughter, my daughter gives me that K. K. <laughs> I get a, a text back K. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Do you have um of the photographs? Did I send you um? Here's another dinner with friends too. Oh there's wow! This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another one there. We do have uh, guys and dolls. Guys and dolls. Tell us about that. 1999, um, same year as Dinner with Friends, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, the Fifth Avenue Theater in, in Seattle with Gregory Harrison playing Sky Masterson. Mm -hmm. Gregory was uh, a good friend of mine and was a guest on my show yesterday, actually. Mm -hmm. I tortured him during this this production. Tortured him. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, that was, that's the only, um, musical I performed in. I've mm -hmm. done a lot of workshops of musicals, uh, but that was the only time I've ever, uh, done one. Did and you like it? Incredible. Uh, Doug Carfrey and Kevin Ligon. Mm. Doug Carfrey on my left, Kevin Ligon on my right. Wonderful, wonderful musical theater guys. I had a ball. Oh Let my, me. you have my okay Cupid dating picture. <laughs> that's uh that's what i use on my dating profile that's what you're doing the dating and does anything you get any response or um uh... it, it, not a lot it's not it's not working for me I, I actually posted this uh because all my classes from the university had to move online and this character is an online te he teaches online and there's another photograph where he's sitting at his computer with a microphone talking into the computer. And I posted that on my Facebook page a few days, a few weeks ago saying the transition to online teaching during, during the lockdown is going very well. That's right. Well, uh, the, 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 you gotta be six feet away from people and 10 feet away from the refrigerator. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. this is the whale. What, tell us about this. This is a play by the amazing uh, Samuel D. Hunter, who won a, um, a MacArthur Fellowship a, 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 f a few months after this uh, uh, this play, uh, and this uh, this was the production. Uh, there were, there had been a couple of productions of it. This wasn't the world premiere, but it was the West Coast premiere at South Coast Repertory down in Orange County. And it's an incredibly moving play about uh, a 600 pound man who is trying to 
salvage his relationship with his teenage, his very angry teenage daughter before he mm -hmm. dies. Yeah. And uh, when they asked me to do it, um, they sent me the script and I, and I read it and, and I said, I, I, I called the casting director who's a friend of mine. And I said, what, when are the auditions? And she said, it, it's not an audition. We want to know if you want to do this. And, uh, I, you know, I said, who's directing it? And it was Martin Benson, who's one of the artistic directors down there. Um, and I said, I said, well, I said, I, I, I have to ask both you and Martin a question before I say yes. And they said, what? I said, do you guys know that I can do this? Because I, I don't know that I can do it. Um, I, I, I want to, but I may need, uh, this is going to be rough. And, and I need, I, I'll need you guys like really behind me. And they said, no, you can do it. And, and one thing we all agreed on is that the New York production, which I hear I didn't see and I heard was spectacular. Um, uh, I, I hear that the, the fella who, who originated the role in New York was, was just incredible. But if you look at the photographs from that, they had the, the suit, but they didn't do makeup on the rest of him. And, uh, I, I, we all felt very strongly that it needed to be uh, a completely uh, believable um, transformation. Um, so we started working on it months before the production. I mean, it's incredible the transformation. Tell, I want to go back to that photo. It, it's so realistic. They hired the. What was that like? Well, they hired the amazing Kevin Haney, who's a prosthetics fellow who uh, does a lot of prosthetics for the, the Marvel movies and horror movies and stuff. And they did a they did a full head, you know, a pour of every all the way down to here. You know, so that piece runs from under my eye. The, the nose that you're seeing is my nose and my mouth is in the clear but the what you're seeing wraps completely around from here all the way up to under my eyes and around my ears and to the back of my head um and then the suit weighed about 30 pounds um and there's actually uh an amazing video uh i don't know you might want to link to it in the in the description there's a, a video on YouTube where we set up. Oh, that's another great picture from the show. Look at that. That's incredible. Jennifer, Jennifer Christopher, another wonderful, wonderful actor. She's terrific in this show. Um, mm. But uh, we, we set up a camera in the makeup costume room uh, and shot the, uh, the entire process of, of makeup and costume and then sped it up to, I think the video is about eight minutes long. Mm. So you, you start out with me as me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that's not makeup is that mustache goatee. Yeah. Um, and obviously letting my hair get really horrible. Um, and, uh, and so then in, in eight minutes, you see every step of the process and the costume they worked on for months, uh, which had layers to it of the 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 foam under part of it, but then over the foam, they sewed pouches that they filled with microbeads, so that as I moved, it would sway. Mm. Um, and then um, uh, I had a friend who who didn't weigh quite that much, but had weighed. <clears throat> uh, almost that much who spent a lot of time talking with me about what it was, what it was like, um, what the, um, both the physical experience, you know, yeah. giving me tips about movement. Um, but also the, the internal psychology of being trapped in that. 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, what was that like? Was it, uh, it must have been, you know, 200 degrees. Was it sort of claustrophobic at all? Or It was, know? and yeah. it was, I had to wear a special uh, vest that had ice packs in it on the, underneath that in order to not just overheat too much. The first time we, um, before we'd figured that out, the first time we tried to do a run through in, um, in the full costume, we got to about 10 minutes from the end of the play and somebody said a line to me and I turned to them and I looked at them and I just went blank. And it wasn't that I couldn't remember my lines. It's just, I couldn't just suddenly nothing was. And, um, everybody rushed to me because apparently the color in my color just, you know, they said, you just, the blood just started draining and yeah. they got me out of the costume and got some orange juice into me. Um, and uh, what I realized is I had been, I'd been trying to eat really healthy, yeah. like salads and vegetable, you know, like, you know, yeah. and then somebody came and, and told me, they said, no, you have to carb up before doing the show because you were running out of um so i actually had a huge big gulp one of those disgusting 7-eleven cups filled with gatorade on stage with me because i'd have to keep myself mm -hmm. cooled down and powered to get through the show wearing that outfit mm. and how many performances did you have to wear that eight shows a week for four mm -hmm. weeks wow yeah. wow and it was about an hour and a half process getting into it. Just to, and how about getting out of it each night? About forty minutes getting out, half an hour to forty minutes. That's incredible, huh? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> have yeah. you um, have you done anything similar to that? We've had to get into a costume that was just a total yeah. transformation. Can you imagine? Remember uh, Bill Bixby when he was the Incredible Hulk in right. that series? Yeah. 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 No, never, um, never anything, uh, li never anything transformative like that before or since. Do you have a preference, uh, comedy over drama? Is there anything that you lean to that you think naturally reflects the essence of who you are, Matthew? I mean, you're very comedic, very quick witted, fast, dry. You know, it's funny. I've done so much comedy on stage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you look at my IMDb page, not a comedy there. I mean, some of the like you know, depth to smoochy or something. But I've I've never done half hour sitcom. Um, that I I've done much more serious drama on television. I tend to play I play a lot of doctors, lawyers, um, or if or the guy who's not necessarily the bad guy, but the guy who kind of ends up going to jail because he screwed up um, the sad sack. But I, I think there's something about this face that casting directors and producers look at and they say, oh, yeah, that's the guy who gives you bad news. Because I've told so many people, I'm sorry, but we did everything we could. We could. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we had him on the table for you know for hours, but there was just too much damn it. You it was know? Too much. We tried. We gave it our all. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, I I told Kathy uh, Kathy Baker that she was dying in Medium. I I told uh, you know in in Veronica Mars. I told her that her father was in a bad car accident. And in Third Watch, I said I don't know if your partner's going to make it. I mean, just over and over again, I'm giving people not very good news. <laughs> something, yeah. about, something about this face. <laughs> so let's talk about your experience, you know, repertory and so much more, the, the college experience teaching you as an adjunct professor and so much more. Um, when did you start incorporating that? Um, into, oh, look, that's funny. Merlin in Canada says your, your ability to be able to, you know, Comfort people and tell them that you saw that, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's the lawyer in you. That's it. Yeah. I got bad news for you. I got bad news. You're, you're going uh, away. You're going away. <laughs> <laughs> I did everything I could. You're going to jail. You're still going away. Um, um, the the desire to want to then inspire others and, and you're teaching uh, as an adjunct professor and uh, repertory theater and so much more. Tell us about when that started coming into play for you, Matthew. 
Well, it's funny. You know, I, I had taught, um, uh, I had, uh, I've been asked to, you know, when you're an actor and you're working, people say, hey, will you come talk to my class? Will you come talk to this high school or something? And I'd done that, but I, and I always enjoyed it, but I never thought of myself as a teacher. Right. Uh, and then um, one day about, God, I guess it was like in 2008, um, a friend of mine was studying at HB studio in New York uh, with uh with Austin Pendleton, who's another person I studied with there, who's an amazing actor and teacher. Just, just a guest a couple of uh, nights ago, he was here on the yeah. show. Well, yeah. That's funny. I w did. Uh, I was uh, working with him just a couple of days ago on a reading. He was w working on a reading of a play that my mother wrote. Mm. Um, that's so funny. Small world, huh? Amazing, amazing teacher, amazing man. Um, and uh, so this friend of mine was in Austin's class and we were meeting for lunch. So I went down to HB and I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for my friend, waiting for class to get out. And I wanted to say hi to Austin. And sitting there and the, with my book and the director of the school walks through the lobby and he stops and he sees me sitting in the lobby and he does a double take and he says, well, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm waiting for a friend of mine. He said, oh, do you want to teach? Simple as that. <laughs> and I was like, uh, I, 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 just, I, I haven't really. Humana, 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 humana. I haven't really thought about it. Uh, what, what do you want me to teach? He said, what, what do you want to teach? And I said, well, let me, let me think about it for a while. Mm -hmm. so I went back to him about a week later and I said, I think I would like to teach just a, a, a scene study class. And I said, and I would also like to teach a class, and I don't know if people will sign up for this, but I'd like to teach a class that is just Uda's exercises, period. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. And they said, well, we'll put it on the schedule and see if people sign up. More people always signed up for just the straight Uda Hagen exercises class than for the scene study class. I mean, they both had people in them, but there were people who really wanted to learn those exercises. Uh, and so I taught there for a few years. Uh, and then when I came out to LA, I started teaching privately out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very hard to get people out in LA interested in just studying Uta Hagen's exercises because everybody wants to just learn how to get an agent and be a TV star. Mm -hmm. Very few people want to take the time to really dig in and learn the craft before. So what's your secret? How are you able to attract them to that? Uh, I'll let you know when I figure it out. <laughs> I, I, I try to, wh what I do, wh what, what happens now is I, I bring them into an on-camera class that I teach. And, uh, and after I've beaten them up for a while, they realize they better go learn how to act, not just how to do a scene for the camera. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of people go into acting originally not knowing that there's the amount of work involved in it that is really necessary. Um, but then, you know, every, almost every teaching job that I've had, I have fallen into uh, the job down at South coast rep. Um, I asked them out of curiosity. I said, you know, I, I said, I taught back in New York. Do you guys need any teachers here in the um, conservatory? And they said, no, we're full up. We have, we have people who've been teaching for us for years. So we, we don't need anybody. And I was like, okay. And then two weeks later, one of them got a, a professorship at a college and left. And they came back to me and they said, remember when you said you might like to teach here? And I said, yeah. They said, you want to, you want to teach here? And I said, sure. Uh, so I started teaching there. And then the woman who ran the summer program was leaving and they asked me to take that over. And then at a barbecue five years ago, I met somebody, uh, the, the husband of one of the people who teaches with me at the conservatory at South Coast Rep, and he's the professor at Chapman University in the film school. And uh, we were just chatting at the barbecue, getting to know each other. And a week later, I get an email from him saying, you want to teach a class at the film school? And I said, 
you know, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm just an actor. And he said, you, you know, this stuff. And so they yeah. hired me and uh, I've been there for, I'm starting my fifth, starting my fifth year in, in uh, September. Mm, that's fantastic. And you're really enjoying it. Oh my God. It's, um, yeah. it, the, the, the students are so great there and, and it, it's opened up a whole new world for me because um, the, the two classes I'm teaching, I'm teaching a class called Introduction to Visual Storytelling, and then I teach a production class. And what I've, what I've been learning as I teach those classes has, uh, I, w I had a real tunnel vision the way I watched movies. I watched them only as an actor, really. Um, unlike everybody else in my family who, you know, watches them as actors, as directors, as you know, my younger brother, Tony, is an editor and into cinematography, and he knows everything there is to know about film. Um, and uh, and I've started, you know, my education in that late, but uh, I'm, I'm keeping well ahead of my students, thank God. And how has it changed? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. Uh, how has the profession changed? And like you said, you alluded a little bit to the fact that, uh, and a couple of folks I was chatting with a couple of nights ago, talking about those who are going into the music industry. Uh, we're living in this uh, super celebrity driven culture right now. And I don't know if maybe this reset, the situation we're going through now globally might reset some of that, maybe in a, in a good way where we're not so buzz and bling oriented. Um, but the, this mentality of, of wanting to be that overnight sensation and, and all of the competition shows, you know, you got to go on this show and be loved by America and they press yes or they press no. And that decides your your career and your love and success and riches and all those things. Sort of this quick overnight instant gratification way, uh, impatient way of doing things when you used to hone crafts like yours and mine and work hard and connect and grow. How has that changed? Do you see it being that way where everybody wants to become, you know, a hit immediately. Yeah. I mean, I have, I have people who, who come into acting class who, who, who have never, who haven't done anything. They haven't even really done anything other than maybe one high school production. And the first question they're asking me is how do I get an agent? Mm. And, you know, I'm trying to explain to them, you, you know, or how do I get an audition? I say, you get, you get one shot at a casting director. You know, you go to the casting director's office and you're horrible. They, they don't see you again. That's it. Um, and uh, I, 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 wrote, I wrote an article once on, on this idea. And that is that, you know, I teach people, I teach people in writing, you know, I teach writing and I teach acting. And I think those are the two arts that people just think they can do. You know, nobody goes to see the Paul Taylor Dance Company and walks out and says, you know, I want to I, I want to do that and I'm going to choreograph something and invite all my friends to see it in two months. You know, nobody goes and looks at the Mona Lisa and says, I, I can do that. Paint that in a week. Yeah. Michelangelo and says, I can do, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that and have an exhibition in three months. <laughs> but people watch, you know, pe you know, we have these computers, right. And mm -hmm. I can write something and it looks like a book. Mm -hmm. um, so they think that, that they can, you know, and I get these manuscripts to evaluate where I realize this person wrote it from beginning to end and they typed the end. And now they're saying here, read the, and I say, did you read it through? Did you edit it yourself before you're handing it to somebody? And the same thing with acting. I think people look and they say that guy on that show is, I mean, look at Mark Harmon on NCIS, right? We were talking about NCIS. I think he's fantastic on that show. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have any knowledge of acting, he's doing very little. He's standing there and he's, he's saying some lines, you know, that's a lot of what we do. And I think people look at them and they say, I, I can do that. Simple as that. Right? It's what I do all day long. I talk and have a cup of coffee. Yeah. 
Mm. You, do you sip the coffee at the right time? Do you put it down in the right place? Do you, you know, and then the minute they get on camera, it's suddenly, instead of sitting on camera and, and saying, you know, instead of saying, hey, Jim, how you doing today? They're going, hey, Jim, how you doing today? You know, it's, yeah, yeah. the camera's on and they yeah. freak Over, out. Overacting. You know, freak yeah. out in front of the camera. And, and these people do this and then some they're you know I, I hear all the time boy this is this is harder than I thought it would be mm -hmm. it's like yeah yeah it is that's because, why because well-trained no matter what it is well-trained fine-tuned professionals I was just having this conversation about who it was just a couple of nights ago it's really cool and it was in this direction in this vein the key to everything that we all do, is to make it look so effortless and easy. And because we make things look so effortless and easy, everybody thinks that they can just flip a switch and just do it. Now, there are people who can, it's just naturally born and maybe they tapped into something and, and they can do that. But a lot of people, because they we make things look so fun and easy and effortless, the, the assumption is, oh my God, it's all glamour and glitz and it's fun and it's effortless and it's parties all the time and it's all this. Meanwhile, you know, uh, behind the curtain, behind the wall, behind the set, there's wires and dumpsters and this and that and craziness to make it all look so easy, sure. right? You know, it's funny. You asked a question earlier that I want to circle back to. You were ta asking about Uta Hagen, and it, it relates to this, that idea of making it look easy and, and what her exercises were about. And she has this one exercise um, about called endowments, uh, about endowments, and which has to do with, you know, making something that's not hot look hot. So on stage, if you pour me a, a, a hot cup of coffee, of course, you're just pouring hot you're pouring cold water into that cup right. and handing it to me. And I tell my students all the time that so much of acting, when you do it right, you'll be doing some really great work. Nobody is going to notice. That's right. You know, so you pour that cup of coffee and you hand it to me and you hold it in your hand for a minute and then you hand it to me and I go like this and I'm holding it. And suddenly the illusion is shattered and everybody in the audience is, is saying knows it's wrong because that cup would be burning my hand. Right. But if you hand me that cup and I, and I, and I reach forward and I, and I, and I take it from you like this and I, Oh, 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 oh put it back. Ah, right. Nobody's going to notice that. Because all they're going to see is me taking a hot cup from you and putting it down. And nobody's going to know that that's acting work. And the, the time that that takes to think about that kind of um, attention to the reality of the circumstance that has to infuse every single aspect and moment of a scene. Um, I... Um, I mentioned earlier that last audition that I had for uh, Dinner with Friends, mm -hmm. where there was this actor that I respected tremendously and that I felt like now I'm not going to get the job. And he was called in for his audition first, and I was out in the lobby waiting. And I'm waiting for my chance to go in. And I don't, I don't know how well you know the play, but the scene they were having audition, us audition with was the scene in the bar where, where Gabe finally confesses to his friend how mm. he feels about his wife, you know, that, that I can't understand how you got, you know, that I cherish my wife. Right. And imagine a, a world without her. And I'm sitting out in the lobby uh, waiting, and I suddenly hear screaming from inside the theater. Mm. And he's screaming these lines. And I'm out there in the lobby thinking, boy, that's um, that's not how I do it. I did it very quietly. Um, and you know, and leaning in and 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 quite and almost buttonholing him as I told him how I feel. Right. Um 
partly because we're we are only two actors on stage, but we the the conceit is we're in a crowded bar at happy hour. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's supposed. Right. Exactly. Right. right. That's that's the circumstance that we're in. We're in a midtown New York. You know, we've all been in those those businessman businessmen bars at five o'clock. You know. Um, and, uh, and so like, so that was the, when I walked into the room and I said to them, what do you want? Th that's partly why I asked, because I had just heard this radically different interpretation of the scene. Mm. And I was informing mine with where are, you know, the environment where, and I'm telling my students all the time, you know, they do a scene and I'll stop them and I'll say, where are you? in the, in the world, you're on a, you're on a park bench or you're, you're screaming, but you're right next to this person or, or you're doing a scene where the, you know, they'll be doing an on-camera scene. And the conceit is that the person they're talking to left and went into the other room and the person keeps doing the scene and they don't raise their voice. I'm saying th they're in the other room now. You, you've got to be aware of that the audience again, isn't going to know when you do it right. Cause they're just going to see reality in front of them. What, what passes for reality, they will know instantly when you do it wrong. That's really amazing too. Cause that's so true. They don't notice sometimes those little details and, uh, but they're very, very important because yeah. it, it, it's all. They're not meant to be noticed. Right. It's just part of the, yeah, absolutely. If, it's if, it's, if you've got to make it look like it's cold outside, if, if it's snowing, you better make it look like you're, you're cold and they're not going to notice that because they're seeing the snow. So of course you're cold. But I, if it's snowing outside and you're in a t-shirt and you don't shiver, th they'll know you're full of crap. Uh, you probably appreciate this. You see it. Sometimes I've seen it in movies. I've seen it on TV shows. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it on stage too, but I've seen it in like soap operas and everything where supposedly they are out in the cold, but the only part that they forgot is that cold steam that comes out of your mouth and they're talking mm -hmm. and that's not happening. So you're kind of like, I think they're probably in a 75 degree studio somewhere. They're mm -hmm. not out in the field. I've actually seen that in a couple of actually recent, uh, you know, cable TV movies and things. And there's uh, no excuse for that now because they can fix it in post. That's the new thing, right? Fix yep. it and post. <laughs> think, you know, absolutely. You uh, there. There are plugins that will just. Yeah, right. You know? To create that effect, exactly. Uh, a lot of people. Uh, you know, I mean, the days of of squibs. And yeah. Packs are pretty much gone. I I got shot on uh, Criminal Minds last year. And I was so excited. I'd never been shot before. <laughs> I'd watched my dad get shot once, you know, and I the, 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 the plate and the squib and the blood pack and the wires and the battery and the bank, you know, I was so excited. And they're like, oh, no, no, sorry, we don't do that anymore. I'm like, what do you mean you don't do that anymore? He said, no, we do it in post. And even the gun. <laughs> There, there was it was an airsoft that doesn't make a sound. This this girl, I felt I I've never felt so stupid in my life. This young woman, the actress who shoots me, she's got to pull out this thing and it goes it goes click, and there's no there's no bang. It's and just I, click. Ah! And yeah. I, I felt like I'm five years old in the backyard playing you know playing cops and robbers. I felt like an idiot. And in, they, they, they put a spark on the end of the gun in post, right? Takes them two seconds to put a on there. And uh, they. That's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then they even have these amazing, you know, when you see somebody like lying in the pool of blood mm -hmm. and you think, oh my God, the, what a mess when they yeah. get up. Do you know what those pools of blood are now a lot of the time? It's not ketchup anymore or spaghetti sauce. <laughs> it's, it's like a, a not latex, but it, it's it's like a it's like a sheet of they have them in all different sizes and shapes, and it has to be completely 
clean, you know, windexed off, and it's laid down on the floor, and you lie on top of it, and it looks like liquid that's spilled yeah. on the floor, like that you'd get at a joke, you know, like the fake vomit you get at a joke shop. Right, right. And all of those things now. That's amazing. People don't realize that. I know through uh, photography uh, with magazines and commercials and ads, they used to, I don't know if they still do it now. There's a couple of, uh, I've done commercials too. So it was on a couple of sets where I saw them do it for the ice cubes and a, like a cool drink of iced tea with like, instead of it being ice, because they'd be on, we'd be on set for hours. Right. They're like uh, clear plastic, you know, squares or, or glass squares. And then uh, the milk that you would see on the Wheaties box or whatever is like Elmer's glue or something. It's like yeah. white glue. It's not milk because the milk would have been curdled hours ago because you're on set for 10 hours getting that perfect shot. Right. Little uh, tricks of the trade. And if it's something that you actually have to drink, those fake ice cubes, the, the good ones are apparently really expensive. You know, I was on it. That look really yeah. good. Yeah, I was on a set. This was in New York, and it was for a, I think it was a regional commercial. And we had this actress that was on, and uh, and she, you know, she's been doing it for a while, so she knows her craft. But I guess she thought she it was making it more realistic, and they didn't mention anything about you know do it in post. So it was a situation. It was a, a I think it was for a pharmaceutical company, and um, she was the one who had to take whatever that pill was. So they wanted, of course, to do it and get the shot again and get it again and get it again and move her over here, get that shot, get that angle, all the different angles, different shots. And every single time she would take another pill of whatever the thing was, I don't know if it was aspirin or something, and just keep actually swallowing as opposed to not doing it and faking it and cupping it or what have you. She was, and everybody was like, what are you doing? Like, oh no, I, you're supposed to, they want me to swallow the pill. Like, no, that was just like the first time maybe, not the other 19 times. Wow. How many How many pills did you take? Oh, I thought it was gonna make it more realistic if I really did it. And they're like, oh my God, you wanna sit down? Do you need a glass of water? Are you gonna call an ambulance? She thought it was going the extra mile, but actually taking wow. in the product. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I heard a, a friend of mine do the same thing, but it was a Viagra commercial, and he's still having a hard time. No. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> you turn it red. Yeah. It's a good color. He was, he was out in the sun today. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, so are you doing that? Are you getting out? I, I know there on the West Coast, things are you know a little tough right now. Uh, we're doing okay here in the Northeast, but I are go you for a uh, white I walking or? walk every day. I'm yeah. an avid cyclist. Me too. Me too. I, I am not cycling now because yeah. I have uh, I have a couple of risk factors that are yeah no problem in my normal life. You know, I'm perfectly healthy. But um, I have a couple of risk factors that I've been told. Uh, I, I have some scarring in my lungs from a very bad bout of pneumonia. The last pandemic, the H1N1 10 years ago, which I got H1N1 and got pneumonia. And uh, so I don't get out on my bike because my feeling is that if I were to, you know, dislocate a shoulder, this is really not the time I want to end up in the emergency room. Or, you don't want to be near a hospital at all, right? Right. Um, I have I have two kids that I want to be around for for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Two yeah. amazing amazing kids. And uh, tell us about them. Are they pursuing this uh, arena as well? My son is interested in writing, um, and uh, he's he's a phenomenal writer. He just graduated from college. In the midst of this, my, my heart breaks for him. Uh, and my daughter, he's 22. My daughter is 16, and she's a dancer. Mm. She, uh, she's studying dance at the uh, at LaGuardia High School in New York, um, mm. their dance program. But of course, they're in the midst of of this horror as well. Um, but she's uh, she's um, excuse me. They're both incredibly talented. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So. Um, when you look at all of this work, Matthew, 
Um, do you have sort of like, you know, maybe like a bucket list? Are there things you still haven't done yet that, gee, you know, I really would like to take a crack at that, or gee, I've always wanted to do that, or that was an opportunity that came and went fast. I wasn't ready for that, but now I'd love to do it. Anything that comes to mind for you? Um, I've always wanted to direct. No, I mean, I just had to say that because that's, that's they all say that. Yeah. I'm flying. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, again, I, I'm going to be, I was set to direct something and then we, we were about to shoot. We were shooting in, we were going to be shooting in May. Um, uh, a short, a short film. And again, something that I didn't pursue, you know, so many of the things that have come my way have come my way because somebody said, we'd like you to do this rather yeah. than me pursuing it. Somebody asked me to direct a, a short film and I, I loved the project and, uh, and have access to an amazing, uh, crew and equipment through the university, which will support professors in their projects. Um, and that's still on the, on the boards uh, when when we can get back to some kind of production safely. Um, I still would like, you know, I am, um, I still would like to do a, a, a TV series and, and be a series regular. I have, I have had a recurring, I had a recurring role for two years on a series called 100 Center Street. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I would like to do that. I, you know, people say to me and, and I'd like to do an hour long dramatic and people say, are you crazy? It's the hardest life and schedule in show business. You know, you, you have no life. You're, you're working all the time. Um, I, I like it. I like the work. I like the rhythm of that life. Um, and I had a, I had a funny, um, thing happen. A couple of years ago, I got I got a you know a lot of these television roles they're they're in and of themselves not that interesting but the money's you know the, you'll get paid more for two days on a TV series than doing a play for eight weeks somewhere and you'll get a year of health insurance out of it so I I, I had this not very good role on a not very good TV series and uh, I was sitting in my trailer waiting to be called to set and I'd been sitting there for about three hours. And I was happy. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, God, why, why are you so happy right now? This is kind of a crappy part and the show's no good. And you're, you're happy as a clam. Mm. And, and I thought, well, you're happy because you're working. And then I realized, yeah, but when I go visit Adam on set or I go visit my dad on set, I'm, I'm happy then, and I'm not in those shows, but I, I, I have that same kind of happiness. And I realized the reason I felt so happy was because I felt like I was home. And the thought that occurred to me was there was, there was so much divorce and craziness in my life growing up. Um, I mean, my family is great and we, we're, we're in a really good place and we all love each other, but it was a long road to get there. Um, and there was a lot of turmoil when I was younger. Um, but the, so the set of a TV show or a movie, I realized it's sort of the closest thing I have to the old neighborhood. You know, if you grew up in one town your whole life and then you could go back there for an afternoon and you'd be like, oh, I know where the drugstore is. I know where the cafeteria is. I know where the school is. And that's how I feel when I'm on on set, whether I'm working or whether I'm visiting a family member or a friend who's working. I feel like I'm back in the old neighborhood. Um, and it's a very comfortable, easy place for me to be. Mm -hmm. So I well, love to have one, you know, and, and there's times where I say to people, I don't care if it's a crappy show. But, but look, we have some suggestions. And since you, you cut the hair, uh, Linda wants to bring back Kojak. So maybe you could be the new oh, Kojak. Be the new Kojak. <laughs> <laughs> or okay. streets, streets of San Francisco. I would be, uh, I'll do it. Um, you know, um, uh, my, my agent, uh, who's my new agent, for, uh, w I signed with this woman who I, I just adore uh, about uh, two years ago. And when she took me on, she said, are there things, you know, she, I think she was worried, you know, 
she didn't say it this way, but what she was asking was, are you on a high horse? You know, she was like, are there things you're going to say no to? And I was like, no, there, there, there's not much I'm going to say no to. Um, I, I like to work. I, yeah. I, I come from the, the Michael Caine school of, you know, you, you get work, you do it. Um, and I, 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 I'm never going to be the kind of star and don't want to be the kind of star that has to think like, Oh, does that fit? Hmm. Mm. Does that fit my brand? Does that fit my image? The, the, my, the brand that I want to have is, Hey, that's, that's a guy who will do what he needs to do to do this part and, and do it, do it well. Um, which is why you're so good at it because you're doing it for authentic reasons. You're doing it organically. And I think people really get that. They understand that they appreciate that. And actually what you just said is quite refreshing because a lot of people aren't doing things for those particular reasons. They're doing it sort of in reverse. They want the other stuff first and then, everything comes the other way. You're doing it for the right reasons. And I think that's, uh, that's really cool. And it's just, a, and, you know, it seems like even with all of this exposure you've had in your life um, to all of these things, you still carved out and you stood true to yourself and stand true to yourself. And you've carved out this path of who Matthew is. Sure, with all these little extra things that happen and all the notoriety and the little things that come along with it, but you still, said, I'm going to stay and be Matthew and do things that please me and please people I care about, you know, as well as the audience, but it's got to be true to my heart. And I think that's a valuable lesson to anybody that does anything in life uh, that they may really love is to stick with it and the resilience that and the tenacity that you develop. Uh, you know, you get some armor and blood, sweat and tears and you get the rejection, all the things that happen, but you still stay authentic and true to you. Because as time goes on, when you look back at it all, you'll be able to say, you know what? I did it, well, like Sinatra said, my way, but I did it. it, it I, I was filled as I was doing it. Yeah. And that yeah. matters. That's important, right? It really matters. You know, and the, the relationships I've been able to build along the way with it, you know, I've, I've mentioned South Coast Rep and, and, and that place, uh, that place has really become a, a family to me. The, the, the kind of work that they do there, the, the people who work there, the relationships I've been able to forge with, with people at that theater um, has really, um, really kept me alive uh, in, inside. Um, so tremendously, I've, I've been really, really fortunate in, in the kind of work I've gotten to do. Really fortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, was anything you would recommend to somebody that's like watching this live now or in the archives and they're considering pursuing this type of work other than follow what Matthew's doing? <laughs> study, study and read. And and watch watch good movies. Watch yeah. old movies. Watch some old movies. Yeah. yeah. Watch Sullivan. Watch watch Sullivan's travels. <laughs> right. Watch the good yeah. stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and people actually right now, with through everything we've been going through, have been really craving a lot of uh, nostalgia. Uh, they've been you know they've been watching like I tell everybody every night. I've been watching a lot of the Dick Van Dyke Show and a lot of the nostalgic stuff. Um, just because it makes you feel good and you, you see the quality that went into so many things uh, from the past, whether it's movies, television, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there's some great, there's some great stuff on now with, uh, you know, with Netflix and, and Hulu and, and Amazon prime and all these different platforms. There's so much, uh, you know, there's, there's some garbage out there. There is so much really good stuff out there now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people saying some great things, such a rich discussion and and love it. And uh, it's nice that you feel like home no matter where the, that set is or anywhere that feels comfortable. We all sort of need that place. And that's really important. I mean, we really, we really, really do. Somebody yeah. asked if you, you do any 
did you do any musicals? Of course, I've they... done just one. I've done a lot of workshops of musicals. Uh, I've only performed professionally in one musical, which was the production of Guys and Dolls in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, there's a photo here I wanted to dig up too. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. We've got the photos. We've got the photos. Uh, actually, this was cool. I think this is the one that's um, Walk of Fame. Oh, was, yeah. 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 Tell, tell us about this one here. We, we call this picture in my family, we call this two guys with exactly the same expression. You and your father, yeah. right? Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this was uh, last summer, I believe. Um, I think it was last summer. He was, he got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and, uh, Steve Carell and I were the were the speakers at the event. I think it's um, I I don't think I will follow Steve Carell again in my career. Um, uh, but it was it was a beautiful day, and I I think it's an honor that he he richly deserved, and uh, I was privileged to be able to speak on behalf of my my two brothers at the event because uh, Adam was in Canada shooting Get Shorty. Uh, well, as I said on the day, I said, uh, I said, I'm very happy to be representing my brothers mm. who couldn't be here today because Adam's in Canada shooting Get Shorty. Tony is performing. Uh, at, I think he was at the uh, the Cherry Lane in New uh, Theater in New York. And I said, I'm playing um, Optimus. Pr uh, I'm signing autographs as Optimus Prime across the street at Grauman's Chinese, so it was easy for me to get here. Just go across the street, <laughs> and you're there. <laughs> I just had to uh, change out of my outfit. <laughs> did, did, didn't need an Uber ride or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Matthew, um, tell us: Do you have a website, places where people want to learn more about some of the cool uh, stuff? I do. I have. I have a website: uh, MatthewArkinStudio.com. Great. Uh, and uh, if you go to Matthew Arkin Studio on YouTube, you'll see my shows, which do not compete with Jim's shows. They're very different than his shows, but I, I think they're uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I do one called Tips and Techniques for Actors, Authors, and Storytellers. Uh, I do another show with my brother, Anthony, called Two Brothers Talk About Food and Movies. That's um, right. Tomorrow night, we'll be talking about Last Man Standing. And... Uh, can I plug? Should I plug my book? Well, yes, absolutely. Oh, look uh, at the look at the graphic. It says author. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have a, a mystery novel called In the Country of the Blind, mm, which is available on um, In the Country of the Blind. It's available on Amazon. Um, What's that book about? Give a little teaser for it. it, it um, my mother, the actress, is also a, a, a wonderful author. And she always said, as I was growing up, write what you know. So uh, the main character is a detective who, uh, strangely enough, was an attorney who was not happy being an attorney. So he quit practicing law. Uh, the difference between he, he, him and me uh, is that he didn't know what he wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. So he, at the beginning of this novel, he's sort of lost in his life um, and gets embroiled in something that, that gives him his new calling, which is solving crime, uh, solving crimes. Um, so that's, uh, that's that story. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you go to my website, you can sign up for my newsletter where I send, uh, you know, I send out articles on acting and writing and storytelling and also any updates on live streams and other things that I'm up to. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I hope when I'm out there, because sometimes some of my television work takes me out to the West Coast. And we have family out there. Oh, uh, get, get together and break some bread. Absolutely, please. Would, and I'm going to that. get in touch with you and have you as a guest on my show. I'd love and, that. And you can talk about, because I think it'll be really good for people to hear about, you know, how we need to take this moment in time and look at, you know, what are, what are my, what is my skill set? What is my personality? What do I have to offer? And how can I turn that into valuable content, which you've obviously done with this show. 
I couldn't do a show like this. You you clearly have the skill set and the knowledge and the talent to do this kind of show very effectively. And uh, and I think everybody needs to sort of look in and say what what is my where is my niche? Exactly. So I think you'd be a really effective guest to talk about that. I would love that. I'd love that. Let's uh, let's make that happen for sure. And everybody's saying they're really enjoying this. Uh, Ernestine, North Carolina. Matthew, I've enjoyed your conversations about your career. Amazing stories. Uh, Christine said that she heard a great interview with your dad and Terry Gross. Oh, well, yeah. talk about somebody who's a great interviewer. Oh, Terry. yeah. She's, Terry. What, a, what a career. She's phenomenal. Thank Absolutely. you, Christine. And thank you, Ernestine. Yeah, thank you for telling us about your life. Very informative. Uh, Renee in Iowa, thanks, Matthew, for coming on to Jim's show tonight. Great show. They're very good. Uh, they uh, they love, you know, complimenting the guests and letting the guests know that they're welcome here in our family. That's Mr. Great. Loverty is awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Linda. Always fun to sit here with Mr. Loverty. Mr. Loverty. Uh, and, and, and with, of course, George Burns. It's George. You, you got to have the George, right? <laughs> got to have your cast of characters. Matthew, yeah, one more very quick story. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. My dad working with George Burns noticed like very, uh, as the day was going on that George Burns had had several martinis and many, many cigars. And my dad asked him, do you do this every day? And George Burns said, yes. And my dad said, what, what does your doctor say about that? And George said, my doctor's dead. <laughs> 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 That's George. <Yep. laughs> well, I told you, I always put a glass down and this was full and look, there's nothing hardly left. I uh, he three sheets to the wind, my friend. That's George. He dips that into he that cigar is like a straw. It just oh, dips. that was him. That's always George. Yeah, it's so it's always George. <laughs> But uh, but this was awesome, and I certainly hope Matthew, you enjoyed the the time with me as much as I have with no, you. This was great, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. You be well. You stay well. You and the family, and uh, we'll stay connected. Look forward to coming on to your show, and uh, when I come out that way, we'll we'll get connected. I look great. forward Thanks. to it. I'll be in touch to schedule you. You got it. I appreciate right. it. Have your your people call my people or something, right? <laughs> we I are. We, I am my people. I was just about to say that we are our people. <laughs> now I'll press a button here. <laughs> All right. Exactly. exactly. You All take right. care and uh, a couple a more in here. Good night, Stay Matthew. Safe, everybody. Stay Thanks safe. For, Thanks for making us laugh. Willie. Now you've got to see this. Willie is the one who stays up. It's like 3.30 in the morning in wow. Holland, in Holland. Very wow. in interesting. So she she's here. She loved the interview. She loved the conversation. Thank, Thank you, Willie. Mr. Arkin for a wonderful interview with Jim, making it easy. Good night, Matthew. It was great. Uh, so lots of good comments and lots of love coming out this way. Matthew, all the best. We will talk soon. Thanks so a, much. It was a privilege and a pleasure, and we'll be doing it again soon. All right. The door's always open. You're always welcome to come back here as well. Thank you. We'll all talk right. to you soon. Take care. Have a good night. Bye-bye now. Wasn't that terrific? Did you enjoy? I certainly did. Uh, that is Matthew Arkin. He is uh, brilliant. I love his quick wit too. He's, he's funny and um, I love his perspective too. He's um, he's a straight shooter. He's authentic. He, he's been able to carve out, even though he's had, you know, the experience of everything you can think of in terms of, um, you know, there's a Hollywood lifestyle that's around him. Uh, however, he's been able to stay true to form and be able to take on work that really matters to him. And then through all of these experiences, of course, learning it from his father, famous Alan Arkin, his brothers as well, and his family, his mother, the actress, and he himself has been able to create his own thing. Because a lot of people, they fall into the trap of being uh, what everybody else wants them to be, or because you're a part of this family or this group, you have to do this. And he's been able to sort of just create his own niche and stay true to it. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing because then you stand out. You know, you may have certain nuances that are very similar to the people uh, within your circle or your family or your loved ones. Gee, you look like your dad or you sound like this one, which is fantastic. That's part of the uh, the, the 
early grounding, right? But then you take that and you run with it and you sort of create your own thing. And that's a beautiful thing to do. And we talk about it all the time here on the show. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, that is the incomparable Matthew uh, Arkin. He will be back with us, I'm sure. The door is always open. I do want to tell you that um, usually we do this in the beginning of the show. So we're going to do it now. Lights, camera, action. Remember, usually we start this in the beginning. So we're doing it sort of towards the end. Uh, I love this thing. And uh, it's something that we just do to put smiles on your face. We do toast to all of you. If you remember, there's something else that we do here in the show. I always tell you guys to relax, to breathe, to love one another. You know, we're it's some really interesting times, I would say, that we've been dealing with. Uh, unusual. The only people that could script this would have been Stephen King or Steven Spielberg, right? As far as how monumental everything has been. It's almost like a Rod Serling Twilight Zone. So when you can, whenever you can, relax, breathe, love one another, take care of one another. Um, I always say I might be the star of the show as the host and producer, but I think you guys are the stars because without you there watching and commenting and telling everybody and spreading the word and doing all that you do, so this show continues to grow and expand. Again, I do this work professionally, but 11 weeks ago, we put this all together here at the home studio, and here we are together, and our lives and our paths have crossed, and I think it's a beautiful thing. So relax. You guys breathe. You take care of one another. Uh, more comments coming in, and then we will uh, wrap up. Great show, Jim. Loved it. Thank you very much. I'm gl so glad you did. Kathleen in New York and Linda in Florida. Great show, Mr. Loverty. Thank you. My pleasure. And have a wonderful night. Good night to you as well. Ernestine, North Carolina. Jim, it was another great show tonight. Good night, everyone. And God bless all. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Willie, you can now go to sleep. It is, uh, what, uh, 7, eight, uh, I don't know, 3, 4, 3 o'clock in the morning where you are in Holland. Thank you very much. You're a trooper. You really are a trooper. Now you can get a good night's sleep. And we'll see you tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, since we do this show every single night of the week. Uh, thanks, Jim, for another great night. Thank you, Renee in Iowa. Great night of entertainment. Linda, wow, we've got, what, five stars? Another five-star interview. Have a blessed evening. You as well. Christine in Connecticut. Night with the heart as well. Night, everyone. Willie and Holland again. A nice evening and a good night. And uh, lots of smooches there. And we give it back to you as well. All right, gang. Thanks for joining us. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. Tomorrow night, we have somebody really cool as well, Sean Wiley. And uh, if you recall, Sean is a fantastic actor and singer and dancer, choreographer. He's with the uh, very popular group you see on PBS, Under the Street Lamp, and he does the choreography and so much more. He's all excited. He's going to perform live on the show for us as well. He's tomorrow night. That's right. He's tomorrow night. So join us for that. Thursday, Barbara Blyer, a fabulous actress, television, film, Broadway, and more. She's with us on uh, that night and that's going to be fantastic friday night stanley livingston you remember him as chip chip douglas with fred mcmurray and william demarest and on grady and then of course his brother who played ernie uh chip is right there on the left chip is with us on friday night then in just a couple of weeks scott schwartz is going to be here you remember him in the toy with Jackie Gleason and Richard Pryor. Matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, my dear friend, Rain Pryor, if you may remember, we did a whole interview with her and it was very inspiring too. Uh, you can see that in the archives at Jim Master City on YouTube. Uh, Scott's gonna be on. Scott was also in A Christmas Story and he was the kid that got his tongue stuck on that metal pole. He's gonna be with us. Sean Kanan, of course, great actor. AJ Quartermain for years in General Hospital and so much more. We have some really cool people. We also had Dr. Bernie Siegel on, and that was really a great interview. Go back in the archives. Uh, he and his grandson were on. Cindy Williams is going to be joining us uh, as well. We look forward to Cindy coming on the show. Uh, she and I met when she was in Nonsense, which, was, of course, was uh, playwright Dan Goggins' fantastic, uh, legendary Broadway play. Rita Cosby is going to be with us uh, very, very soon, in about a week, Rita, of course, is a legendary news anchor and a broadcaster, radio host. She's a dear friend, and uh, you've probably, you've probably, I'm sure you've seen her on networks over the years. Uh, so she's going to be with us as well. And again, one more time, Sean Wiley, my very special guest tomorrow night. Dear friend, have interviewed him multiple times over the years on uh, PBS. We do thank our very, very special guest uh, tonight, 
Al, uh, Matthew uh, Arkin, he is incredible. You can see resemblances too. That, that he does have a lot of his father and his brothers uh, in that. I love this shot. He was telling us about. Isn't that a cool shot with Eli Wallach? Really amazing. And again, some of these incredible photos that we've shared with you during this broadcast and all the behind the scenes stories. I mean, that's just amazing what he was able to do to pull that off. That's just incredible. Uh, that's not something everybody can do. And uh, he was able to do that. And, and this is just a few pictures. We even talk about the fact he was actually on Hawaii Five O as well. Da -da 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 -da. You got it. And uh, really cool stuff, real gentleman. Very talented, very funny, very witty, and we loved having him on. So, uh, and on Sunday, Bruce Valanche is going to be here. The incredible comedian, Bruce Valanche, is going to be here on Sunday. That's an incredible show coming up on Sunday, a special show on Sunday as well. All right, gang, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for all. And Bart, thank you very much. Caught the tail end of the interview. Just worked with Matthew last week in reading. Bart, shout out. Yeah, Bart. And you're going to be coming on as a guest on the show as well. Yes, he is a fabulous actor. He's really, really cool. Cool guy too. You know what I mean? And that's what we love. So gang, we're going to sign off. Um, we still have dinner waiting. It's uh, 920. I tell you, when I first started this series of shows, I said that we were only going to do our shows. That went out the window. I don't know. It's like my uh, long emails and texts and and voicemails, I don't think I can do an hour. I mean, if we had to, if we had a top of the hour national break we had to get to or something, but uh, but it's worth it. Good conversation, good people, good times, laughs and levity here on the show. So we're gonna wrap. You guys, you take care of yourselves. You be well, love all of you. Thanks for all the support and love and encouragement from around the world. We'll be here tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. I'll be here. The gang, George and Jeannie and all the rest will be here. Hope you're here too. Good night, gang. Love you all. Thanks for watching this episode of the Gym Master Show Live. See you tomorrow night. Take care.